Okay, uh, if you've got your Bibles, um, turn with me to Luke chapter 19, and we'll be reading from verse 1 to 10. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. We're in a, a long series to the book of Luke, uh, and today, as you find in the text, Luke 19, 1 to 10, uh, realize we're, we're going to be almost concluding a, a, a thing that Luke looked at a, a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago, Luke showed us uh, through the teachings of Jesus, of the dangers of money. And we came to that famous phrase, that often overused and misquoted phrase, that it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Well, tonight, Luke is going to show us a camel going through the eye of a needle. And what are we going to be confronted by in this passage? And I... And I lack words, but the insane miracle it is to be saved. And again, evening service, you guys are the holier than thou. You know, you come out in the evening to go to church. We know it. We've heard this so many times, and there's a terrible thing that we get bored with the miracle of salvation, right? I heard an illustration of a man who used to live next to a railway track. And when he invited people next to this train would go right by his house and like the whole house would shake and shudder and everyone would like dive, you know, because it's terrifying. And he would look around like, what are you, what's going on? What are you, what are you, and they're like, didn't you hear that? It's like, oh, yeah, that's a train. That happens all the time. It's this terrifying moment for everyone else and he's so used to it. And so that's what happens to our salvation. It's, it's a miracle that we get used to. I'm hoping that we go confronted again, that it is incredible that we believe and are saved. So let's read together in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay in your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything. I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. May the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, this story is like the top ten of Sunday school stories, right? Like every Sunday school, if you've ever been through Sunday school, you have gone through this story of Zacchaeus up a tree. And my mentality uh, of this story is effectively like a Danny DeVito type looking guy. And for some odd reason, dressed in, and I don't know why this, I blame the Sunday school pamphlets that we always got. He's in this cool tunic that's always brown and orange. I don't know why. It's always brown and orange, right? And he's really chilling on this tree, his legs dangling as Jesus walks up, right? Mental image. And I guess for that reason alone, it hits on the stories to tell kids. Because it's a cool story. A guy up a tree, orange and brown tunics. I mean, come on, it's just, it sells. And I guess the, the, the second part of the story is this absurd generosity that comes out of Zacchaeus' conversion becomes the moralistic kind of nail in the coffin that we want to drive into kids. You see, when salvation comes, kids, it makes you generous. This is the story you have heard, eh? I think that story, however, misses the overall narrative that Luke is trying to tell us. It's the overall story that, that Luke wants to emphasize. You see, in terms of Luke's gospel, in terms of the story, this is positioned just before Jesus enters Jerusalem. In fact, there's been a couple of weeks back, we got to the point where it says Jesus set his face like a flint to Jerusalem. He was single-minded about getting to the cross so that he 
could do what he was put on earth to do, which is to die for the sins of mankind. He is set to that. He is on a mission. His mind is locked to the task. But to get there, he has to go through Jericho. And as he walks into Jericho, I mean, this verse starts, passing through Jericho, he is stopped in his tracks by a rich man. And not just a rich man, but a tax collector, a sinner. And so if we read the story properly, it forces us to ask the question, why does Zacchaeus get saved? Why does Zacchaeus get saved? And the single answer, the simple answer, I'm going to sell the end before I've even got there, so I'm not going to drag you along, is it's a miracle. It's just a miracle. Why does Zacchaeus get saved? Because it's a miracle. So let's look at his story. Let's see how Jesus comes to us and to him. And to do this, we must look at this guy, Zacchaeus. Who is he? Well, he's the short and wealthy. That's our first point. Luke's descriptors of this funny little man is he's a chief tax collector and that he's very wealthy and short. Great. I feel like I know the guy, right? Character study on this. Go, team. No, it's a bit of a painfully thin character development, right? We don't know anything about this guy except he's short and rich. And his name, Zacchaeus. But what Luke gives us about Zacchaeus is enough to subvert any ideas of how we think or might think salvation works. What do I mean? Well, a couple of chapters back, Luke establishes the danger of wealth. I've just said that. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, is what Jesus says. However, here, Luke in his writing subverts that expectation. Zacchaeus was wealthy. In fact, probably excessively so. Being the chief tax collector of Jericho, he would be rich. But that wasn't his only issues. So what else was? Well, something comes up in Luke's description of this man is that he is short. And it's connected to this shortness getting in the way of him seeing Jesus. And what we might just read over is, ah, there's this poor short guy like trying to get through and he can't see. But what we don't pick up is the subtext of why is no one helping this man see Jesus? Like, what's going on here? Like a poor short guy. I mean, I don't know. It's an honest shame society. But like, don't pick on the short guy. I mean, come on. It just seems rude. In fact, there are some commentators that suggested that Zacchaeus might have even been a dwarf. Like, significantly short. I mean, that seems even worse. Why were they keeping us? Well, Luke tells us in verse 7, the crowd didn't like this guy. It grumbles to itself when Jesus invites him over for dinner. Why is he going there? This guy's a sinner. Now, we hear that today, and it's like, okay, he's a sinner. You know, uh, Only God can judge me. Everyone's a sinner. We love that. In this context, that's saying, like, this guy is low. This guy's a rubbish. Why is Jesus going to be with a rubbish? Let me give you some context. Let's be real. No one loves paying tax. You know, I'm almost on the I'm almost on the 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 the, the group that's like tax is theft. You know, like it's, when I see how much of my income goes towards paying towards nothing, I'm like ah, it's theft, right? No one likes tax. No one likes tax collectors. But to add insult to this kind of tax collecting is that Zacchaeus was collecting tax not for the Jews, but for the Romans. He was a Roman tax collector. Now again, remember, the Romans were the invaders of Jerusalem, of Judea, and what they would then call Palestine. So they were taking tax out of a oppressed people at the end of a sword. If you didn't pay tax, it wasn't like, oh, you get a fine. It's, yeah, you get killed. The soldiers would come after you and murder you. And these taxes were always exorbitant. And you paid them or you died. That was the thing. So now let's go back to Zacchaeus. Do you understand why the crowd's a little kind of, you know, Zacchaeus, stay back. Like, please, don't touch me. 
I don't want your ickiness on me. Like, don't get me the, the tax gene, you know, cooties or whatever. Zacchaeus made his wealth by this corrupt system. And the crowd's lack of care for Zacchaeus was a result of the fact that he was the benefactor of a pretty bad system. He wasn't doing anything illegal. In fact, he was following the law to its letter. But that what didn't mean he was doing something moral. Hence, the crowd hates him and pushes back. But Zacchaeus would not be dissuaded. This little man runs ahead and climbs a tree to glimpse Jesus. And this leads us to the second, theme, second uh, point of tonight, which is hiding and seeking. Now, to address something before we move on, is the visual image of the short man with his feet hanging off the tree, like, you know, like we would like to with our hands on a pole and looking nicely, is probably completely incorrect. Again, remember, this is an unashamed society. I mean, I'm, I'm nearly 40, and to climb a tree is not embarrassing, but it's difficult. And I can understand why in these societies it's embarrassing, it's actually shameful for a man to climb a tree. So Zacchaeus is not sitting up in the tree, swinging his legs, having a good time. This guy is hiding. He's downright embarrassed. Why is he embarrassed? Well, he can't see. He's hiding. But his state of hiding, church, comes with a bit of a twist. You see, Jesus was passing through Jericho. He set his mind on Jerusalem. However, this man hiding in this tree causes Jesus to stop. And not only stop, but completely pl change Jesus' plans. In verse 5, we read these words. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. Come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. And there's such a powerful reality in this, in, this, in this verse. And that is the nature of grace. That Jesus hits this poor man hiding in a tree. Grace, church, calls us out of our hiding. In the place where we don't want to be found. That's where grace calls us. The thing is, let's be real. No one finds salvation from a place of strength. Not a single person in history has been saved because they were good enough. Yet many of us come to church pretending to be this. We, we want to be okay. We want our lives to be right. And then we will come to faith, right? Then we will make our plans with God. Words like that. But church, God never calls us from our achievements. He never saves us from our strengths. He calls us from our hiding and church from our embarrassments. I'm going to stretch the text a little bit, but bear with me. This is not gospel truth, but this is me making a point. There's a tendency of short men to overcompensate, right? Like short man syndrome and all. And I can imagine that this lack of stature in this poor man Zacchaeus had had pushed in him a drive to be that, to overcome, to, to show the world that he can do it, right? To overcompensate for his smallness. In fact, I, I have the suggestion, again, not gospel truth, just my suggestion, that in fact Zacchaeus ends up in this corrupt legal system because he had told himself, if I get powerful, if I get rich, then I'll be okay. Then everyone look at me and I'll be all sorted and then I can lord it over them, even in my smallness. Then I will be uh, uh, respected. And yet, what drives him up the tree? His shortness. The very thing he's trying to overcompensate for. It is his shortness that drives him up a tree and yet, hiding in this tree, Jesus spots him. In his shame and in his embarrassment, church. That's where Jesus says this amazing statement. Zacchaeus, I must stay with you. I must stay with you. You see, Jesus calls Zacchaeus in his shame. And he says, I want to break bread with you. I want to show you, Zacchaeus, that to me you are accepted. 
I'm not affirming your lifestyle. In fact, the response of Zacchaeus shows, I'm not affirming what you're doing, but, but Zacchaeus, I see you. And I see you even in your shame. I see you like no one else sees you. And I want to eat with you. I want to break bread with you. I want fellowship with you. I accept you. I want to stay with you. And church, that's grace. That's always what grace is. We come here tonight, each of us with a myriad of shames and crises that we'll walk into this church with. Every single one of us is hiding something from the world or from ourselves. We know this. I won't do the experiment, but we know this. We're hiding, right? We don't want to be found out. We make excuses for these. We explain them away. We place other things in our lives to overcompensate for them, to prove that we're okay, to make up for the way we feel inside. And so we spend our lives doing what? Hiding. Just want to ask a question tonight. How many of us are up a tree tonight? And I don't mean mad. I mean follow the illustration. How many of us tonight have come to church and we're literally pretending? We're playing games. And I want to say tonight, Jesus sees you. He sees you up your tree and calls to you and says, I want you. More than that, I died for you. And it's there, church, it's there that real change happens. And that leads us to the last point, which is the impossible made possible. You know what the whole theme of this story is? I've already given away. The story of Zacchaeus is that salvation is always a miracle. It's Jesus coming to us in our hiding and calling us out to be with him. And let's just stop for, for a second and recognize that, that that is a miracle. I said as we started, we get so bored with that. But just, just think about what it means that you are saved. For you to be saved, the Son of God, had to come from his heavenly home, his perfect existence, and be born into vulnerability, into the vulnerability of a child, to experience all the human strugglings and problems and pains. For what? For what? Verse 10 tells us, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's something we struggle to believe, but it's something incredible. Jesus loves us in our lostness, church. In our hiding, in our struggles. This is where Jesus calls us. This is where Jesus loves us. He doesn't want us to stay there, but this is where he finds us. Because guess what? That is where we are. Our hiding is a game. It's a pretend. It's not who we are, and that's why it wears us out. That's why it drains us. How many of us tonight are exhausted of pretending to be something we're not? Drained of the constant proving and constant hiding and constant pretending. You know why you're exhausted? Because that's not you. It's a fabrication. It's a lie. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus wants you. And you know what's terrifying about that? Is then you have to own who you are. You have to realize you're up a tree. <laughs> the miracle of salvation, church, is that it comes to us. We don't go to it. And that answers, that, that poses a question, which is, why should I be sought out by God? What is there about me that's so special that 
the God of heaven and earth would leave heaven and come down for me. And more so than that, he would leave his glory and die for me. What is there about me that's special for that to happen? And you know what the, the terrifying answer to that is? Absolutely nothing. I'm a sinner, just like Zachary. And the simple truth of this message is that every person here tonight is a camel threading the eye of a needle. Every single one of us. We are an impossibility, humanly speaking. We're a miracle. You don't seem excited about that. Obviously, I haven't done my job. What we see is once this happens, once we realize this, that life changes completely. Zacchaeus, in this miraculous encounter, in this threading of a needle, comes out the other side and says this absolutely absurd statement in verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here I now give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone about anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. And this statement dumbfounds commentators. In fact, most of the commentators ignore it. They literally, most of them said this, this statement is so absurd as to doubt the salvation of Zacchaeus. He's falling back into old habits. I mean, it is ridiculous. He's given away half his money. So he's, boom, half his money gone. Then he's like, if I've cheated out anyone, his job was to cheat people. That's how he made his money. He's like, I'm going to get, I mean, it seems impossible. In fact, one commentator claimed that Zacchaeus is falling back into sinful patterns. He's becoming a boaster. He's trying to overcompensate for his shortness. And I'll say, okay, let's take that. Maybe it is. Guess what? You're going to get saved. Miracle. You're going to change. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to drag your whole sinful life into this salvation. And guess what God's going to do for the next couple of years that he gives you on this beautiful garden planet that he's given us to live. He is going to make sure that those idols and those sinful patterns get worn out of you. That's grace. That's what he does. That's what God is in the business of it. We bring a bunch of sinful patterns into our new life. And God slowly roots them out. It's called sanctification. Maybe that's what we're seeing here. But even if we're not, what we have seen and what Jesus confirms by his words later is that this life is forever changed. It's changed. You don't get back from giving away half of your possessions. And you don't give away, you don't give away half of your possessions until, unless something radical has changed. Think about the contrast between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. One was bound by his wealth. The other, Jesus runs into his life like a 10-ton truck and smashes any hope and grip of his wealth ever had on him. He was devastated. He had nothing left. He's like, I just have you. Lord, take it all. Church, that's what we are tonight. That miracle in slow motion. That camel threading the eye of a needle. When Jesus invades your life, church, you become a walking miracle. And I guess the lesson for tonight is stop not living like that. Stop digging up the old dead man that the 10 ton truck literally wiped out. Stop living in the sinful patterns. Walk in the miracle because Jesus, church, has seen you where? Not in your strengths, not in your pretending, not in your playing, but up your proverbial tree. 
without your ladder, here's your everything. Live like that. Fall again prostrate at the cross and realize again what a miracle we have in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. I mean, that's all we can say. It seems so passé. But thank you that you seek and save the lost. I can understand why Paul would write later, this is a true and trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came into the world to die for sinners of which I am chief. Lord, when you see us in our sins, Lord, we have nothing left. We have no more hiding. We can just fall prostrate and say, you are, you are Lord. Take it all. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone here tonight, anyone who's struggling with the old struggle, and we give up and realize that you see us even deeper than we see ourselves. You see us to our core. You see us in all our pretending, in all our playing, in all our games. And you call to us and call us to be children of the Most High God. Lord, if there's anyone here who's never, never seen you, who's never heard you call in their hiding, Lord, humble them tonight that they would come out of their tree and embrace you. Confess their sins, give up on their hiding and live in the light as you are in the light. Lord, we pray this for the glory of the Father and in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand as you sing our closing?